time to join us and we'll begin shortly with our introduction and our program from Jewish Live and Dr. Sarah Benoit. Okay, we, uh, I'm gonna wait one more minute for those of you who are just joining so that we can make sure everybody can join us and we have time uh, for a program that's now 401 in about 60 seconds we will begin. Welcome everybody. My name is Joshua Holo. I am the Dean of the Jack H. Scoball campus in Los Angeles of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you and pleasure to moderate this session on Jewish languages and names from Dr. Sarah Benor and hosted by Jewish Live. We are now recording and I will be moderating this uh, session uh, primarily uh, introducing Dr. Benor and curating and collating things at the end. Um, and there will be various junctures at which the, um, the program will call on you to interact and we encourage you to do so. Uh, and at the end, I will convey the questions uh, to Dr. Benor. When you would like to pose a question or answer a question posed by Dr. Benor, notice the A and chat bubbles on the bottom of your screen which you can use to do so. And you'll also see them appear on the margin of the right-hand side of your screen in the right. Dr. Sarah Benor is the HUC JIR Professor of Contemporary Jewish Studies on the Skirball campus in Los Angeles. She's widely published in more journals and articles than I could possibly list, but worthy of note is her most recent book, a collaboration with Jonathan Krasner and Sharon Avni, which came out just now this year, called Hebrew Infusion and Community at American Jewish Summer Camps, which those of you who participated in this program last week got a taste of in the program from among all three of them, Professors Krasner, Avni, and Benor. Dr. Benor is also the founder and director of the Jewish Language Project. Today, uh, we are all in for an amazing treat as she tells us the story of our Jewish names worldwide, so with some focus here in the United States. In this story, moreover, Dr. Benor brings us on an odyssey, not just of our transatlantic narrative, but more importantly, of our emerging identity as Jews in the modern world. It's a touching and revealing story, and most of all, it's our story. So, to do. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Sarah Benor, on the topic of Jewish surnames and name, change, name changing around the world, diversity and unity. Thank you so much, Dean Holo. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I thank HUC for sponsoring this along with Jewish Live. And uh, just to answer a question that already came in, no, we cannot see the participants. We can all, you can see us, but we cannot see you. But we will expect your participation at various points throughout this uh, webinar. So I'm gonna start with a video. And in uh, memory of Jerry Stiller, it's a video that he created with his wife, Ann Mira, in the mid 1960s. Much. Uh... Recently, there's uh, been a lot of talk about computers in the newspapers. They've even managed to date people with the help of computers. So Jerry and I would like you to meet a couple who have been ideally matched by a computer, and uh, they meet for the very first time. Mm -hmm. 
How do you do? How do you do? I'm Hershey Horowitz. <laughs> I'm Mary Elizabeth Doyle. <laughs> Doyle? Horowitz? Horowitz. H-O-R-O-W-I-T-Z. <laughs> Hershey. My friends call me Hesh. <laughs> Doyle. D-O-Y-L-E. My friends call me Mary Elizabeth. Is Doyle your real name? Sure. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be my real name? I don't know. I mean, uh, I was just hoping you... <laughs> no, we're Doyle. We're Dempsey's on my mother's side. Dempsey. <laughs> Horrible. Schmollowitz on my mother's side. <laughs> so we see here a really interesting fascination with names. The idea that people change their names and the idea that American Jews have distinctive names in contrast to other Americans. And so I'm gonna be talking about these issues through this outline. First, the history. When did Jews acquire surnames? Name types, what's with the Owitz and Berg? And why do so many Jews have placed their surnames? And name changing, why did so many Jews in the US change their surnames? So the content of today's talk is based in part on many books and articles by Alexander Beider, who is the world expert on Jewish names. The main points that I want to make today are the commonality and diversity of Jews around the world. The commonality in that there are the combined trends of assimilation and distinctiveness. That is, they're integrating into local societies. We can see that through their names, but we also see the distinctiveness in their names. And we see both tradition and creativity. We also see some common professions and traits around the world, and we see a common history of migration. But at the same time, we also see the similar sources of influences, the local cultures, biblical and rabbinic texts, and pre-migration cultures. Now, the diversity that we see is also based on migrations because there were different migrations in different Jewish communities. There was also different legislation in different countries and empires and different naming patterns in different places. So let's start with the history. <clears throat> Traditionally, Jews did not have hereditary family names. They went by their name, son or daughter of their father's name. So Rachel bat Moshe, Shlomo ben Yishai HaKohen. And groups in different places began to acquire hereditary family names at different times. In the Middle Ages, this happened in Spain and Portugal. In the 12th century in Morocco, 15th century in Algeria, 16th century in Italy, 17th century in Prague, Frankfurt, and some rabbinic dynasties in Eastern Europe, and the 18th century in Alsace-Lorraine. But it was not until 1787 that many, many Jews throughout Central and Eastern Europe got their family names. It happened in different places at slightly different times. It sometimes was a general decree for all citizens, and this had to do with the modernization of the country. But sometimes it was specific to Jews if other groups already had names and had to do with the emancipation of Jewish communities, the idea that they were no longer just a big community that had no individual identities, but now they were individual citizens of the countries that they lived in. And it had to do with their integration into the cultural conduct of each country. So here's where it happened at different places, 1787 in the Habsburg Empire and going through 1821 in Poland and, and throughout the 19th century in other parts of the Pale of Settlement. And then outside of Eastern Europe, the name, uh, the, they tended to get their names later in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Greece, although some of the Jews in Greece and Turkey already had names because they were Sephardim and they had gotten them earlier. Syria, Iraq, India, etc. And Yemenite and Ethiopian Jews tended to get their names when they arrived in Israel. 
So who selected the names? Well, sometimes it was the individuals themselves. Sometimes it was a communal authority within the Jewish community. And sometimes it was Christian authorities or Muslim authorities that were not connected to the Jewish communities. Sometimes Jews used names that were also used by non-Jews, but sometimes their names were unique. So now I'm gonna talk about Jewish surname types. And here are the different categories. And there will be a quiz. So please pay attention. First, we have patronymic names. In the Ashkenazi community, that is Jews from Central and Eastern Europe, we have patronymic names, meaning the, based on the name of their father, like Abramovich, Isaacson, Jacobs, and Moses. So sometimes you have suffixes from Slavic languages like Ovich, son from Germanic, the S, or just the name itself. And then Sephardi communities, it tends to be just the father's name, like Nisin, Sasson, Rachamim, but sometimes there's an E at the end, like Nachmani. And we see this in Iranian communities as well, but you have different suffixes. Uh, you can see the different suffixes here, Pur meaning son of, Zadeh, born of, Nejad from the race of, and Iyan from the group of. So examples are Yagubian, son of Jacob, Eshtiag Pur, son of Eshtiag, Acham Zadeh. And that one is interesting because Acham is from Chacham, meaning wise, but also meaning rabbi. So that means the son of the rabbi, Acham Zadeh. And Georgian communities tend to use Ashvili as their patronymic suffix. So you get names like Aron Ashvili, Davita Ashvili, Ishak Ashvili, Yaakov Ashvili. Mountain Jews tend to have ev or of as their patronymic suffix. And the spelling tends to be influenced by Russian. So instead of saying Yahudayev, it's Yagudayev because Russian does not have the H sound and instead pronounces that as a G. Bukharian Jews from Central Asia have names like Binyaminov, Ishakov, and Yakubov. And now we get to a related category, which is matronymic names. And this was not nearly as common as patronymic names um, and tends to be just in certain Ashkenazi communities. So you get names like Frumkin, child of Frumme or Frumke, uh, which means pious, Dworkin, child of Devora, Rickles, child of Rivka, Bayless, child of Bela, and Roskies, child of Rose or Roske. The next category is occupation. You get names like Kirshner and Metzger, Madar and Tabib, Del Medico and Fornaro. And these are actually all non-Jewish names too. You might think that everyone named Kirshner and Metzger are Jews, but there are also non-Jews with these occupation names. There are some Jewish specific occupations like Malamed, teacher, Gabai, basically meaning synagogue administrator, Chazan, cantor, Shochet, ritual slaughterer, and Katsav and Kachevsky, meaning butcher. The next category is geographic or toponymic names. And this is names that have pieces in them. And generally, it means that the person who has this name has an ancestor from that place. Because if they got their name and their name was a place, and let's say that their name was Deutsch and they lived in Germany, that wouldn't make sense because everyone there in their area lives in Germany, right? So that this means that they had a parent or grandparent or earlier ancestor from these places. Um, and so you get names like Deutsch, Wilner, Brandeis, Hamadani, Esfahani, Tehrani. And in India, many of, most of the Jewish names in the B'nai Yisraeli there are names of villages, names like Rajpurkar, Charikar, and Ashtamkar. And you might be wondering why so many Sephardic Jews are named Ashkenazi or Eskenazi. And that has to do with their families having an ancestor who was from Germany originally. The next category is characteristics. You get names like Gross, Klein, Roth, and Geller, which mean big, small, red, and blonde. 
you also get characteristic names that have to do with the hereditary caste. That means that they were part of the Kohen or Levi designation. And this is something that Jews uh, inherit through their father. And so it makes sense that they would also inherit that in their last name. Not all people who are Kohanim have the name Kohen. Some have other names unrelated, but some have names that are kind of translations of that, like Kaplan, which means chaplain. Kahani is a, an Aramaic version of Kohen and Kagan or Kagan, our Supreme Court Justice, is a Russianized version of that. Because again, they didn't have the H sound in Russian, so they pronounced that as a G. And of course, names like Levi, Levine, Levitt, etc. We also have acronym names. And this means that they were the son of a rabbi. So names like Braff, as in Zach Braff, probably had an ancestor whose name began with a pay. So Ben Rabbi Pinchas or Ben Rabbi Peretz. And Bram, Bagad, Barad, all of these kinds of names. And my favorite, Babad, Ben of Beit Din, which means son of the head of the uh, rabbinic court. Another category is unrelated to all of these that I've been talking about, and it's just names that sound beautiful. They're called ornamental or artificial names. So these could be names of an animal that the person identified with or liked, or it could be colors. Not If, if their name was green or blue, it doesn't mean that they necessarily had green or blue eyes. It could have just been a color that they liked or that the person who assigned their name liked. Pardo meaning brown, positive qualities like hope and charity, esperanza and sadaka. Another type of ornamental name is house signs because these were based on signs that Jews had on their home. There were no street names or numbers in certain towns. And so people would say, mine is the house with the eagle on the sign, or mine is the house with a red sign. So Adler means eagle, Rothschild means red sign, and Schiff means boat or ship. But the main type of ornamental and artificial name, and perhaps the most common type of name among American Jews, is the name that is that incorporates an element from column A and an element from column B. So you get names like Goldenberg, Silverstein, Eisenfeld. And so just take a minute and look at this list and try to memorize what the words mean because this is gonna be part of the quiz. I'll just give you a minute to look at that. Now, I bet many of you know people with names like this, or some of you might even have names like this. And this also leads to the question, did Jews purchase more beautiful names? Now, um, the question is kind of hard to answer because we don't have historical records of that happening. And the reason is because bribes wouldn't have been recorded in any official way. But the reason that scholars think that this didn't happen or didn't happen much is because the beautiful names were very common. Names that were derogatory or ridiculous were actually quite rare. So names like meaning criminal or monkey's face or cat's wing or crab's paw were actually very rare and names like Goldenberg and Silverstein were, were quite common. Also, another piece of evidence that this probably didn't happen was that Jews generally ignored their surnames for several decades. If they had paid for them, then they probably would have used them for community internal affairs, but they really only used them for their official documents, like their passport. And they did not, and for taxation purposes and conscription purposes, they did not use them in their communities. In fact, they continued to go by their patronymic name, Rachel Bat Moshe, uh, long after they got their official last names. Okay, are you ready for the quiz? Here we go. 
So here, I'd like you to put your answers in the chat. And uh, Josh, if you wouldn't mind, please read out the answers as they come in, okay? Here we go. What do these names have in common? Yagubian, Yankluitz, Yakubashvili, and Kopilovich. One person says they're Georgian, uh, son of Jacob. One son person. of Jacob is correct. Yakobashvili is the Georgian name, but the other names all mean son of Jacob. Yagub Yanklo, Yankel is a diminutive form of Jacob. Yakobashvili and Kopilovich, Kopil is also a diminutive form of Jacob. Okay, here's the next one. What do these names have in common? Rabinowitz, Achamzadeh, and Bardas. I got a bunch of son of rabbi. That's right. They all mean son of rabbi. Rabinowitz, son, rabbi's son, achamzadeh, chacham son, and bardas is one of those acronym names. Good job. Here we go. The next one is Toledano, Cordovero, and Alkali. We Our first answer is in. We have some say they're Sephardic. Others say yes. that they are lit place names. They're, that's both. They're both right. There are place names in Spain. Okay, how about this? Scheindlin, Zeldin, Bayless, and Saracen. Some people are saying matronymics. Some people That's are it. Saying yeah, it's matronymics. So Scheindl means beautiful, Zelda, Bela, and Sarah. In fact, if my children were coming up with their names today, they might be named Saracen or Markson. Okay, how about these? Viterbi, Modigliani, or Castelnuovo? There's a lot of appreciation for Italian here. And some <laughs> yep. people recognize that they're places. Yeah, that's exactly right. They're places in Italy. And you may have heard of a famous composer named Castelnuovo Tedesco, who has two, is, he was Jewish, and he has two place names in his name, Castelnuovo, a town in Italy, and Tedesco means German in Italy. So he must have had one ancestor who was from Germany. How about these? Kaplan, Katz, Kagan, and Sacerdote. We got, uh, everyone seems to recognize that they are Cohen's priests. Exactly, Sacerdote or Sacerdote is a, uh, an Italian way of saying priest. And Katz, it means Kohen Tzedek, righteous priest. And it's, a, it's an, another one of those acronym names. It also does mean cat, but the reason that Jews chose it is not because they had a beloved pet cat, but rather because they were a Kohen. Okay, how about these? Horowitz, Landau, Shapiro, Ginsburg, Epstein, and Katzenellenbogen. Someone says it's a law firm in Forest Hills. I <laughs> love it. Okay. Topographic names in Germany. Exactly. That's right. These are all towns in Ashkenaz. And they happen to be some of the most common names, except Katz and Ellenbogen, which means Katz Elbow, but is the name of a town in Ashkenaz. Um, but yes, yeah, so these are all based on town names. Someone Pardo. Said, yeah, go ahead. What's that? Someone said they all belong to my temple. <laughs> right. Okay. Pardo, Azulai, Roth, and Weiss. Colors. Yes. They could be characteristics or they could be ornamental names. That's right. Snyder, Chait, or Hyatt, Kravitz, Fingerhut, Scherer, Portnoy, Needleman, and Sabo. Jobs, occupations. That's correct, but it's a specific type of occupation. Taylor, people are recognizing. Yes, Taylor. They all mean Taylor. Snyder is German. Hyatt is Hebrew. Kravitz is Polish. Fingerhut means finger hat or thimble. Scherer means cutter. Portnoy is Russian. Needleman, needleman, German. And Sabo is Hungarian. 
Okay, you guys are doing great. Now we just have one more part of the quiz and that is the matching game. So I'm gonna show you a picture and you tell me which name that picture represents. So here's the first one. We got a lot of Roth blooms in here. That's correct, it means red flower. How about that one? People are practicing their German, coming up with Rosenzweig. That's correct. It means Rose Branch. How about that one? Yeah, they all got the golden gold stone. Gold stone, right? This one's a little weird, but so is the name. <laughs> one person came in with Sternberg. That's another... correct. And so it means Star Hill which doesn't really make sense, right? And that's what these artificial names are all about. If you have an ancestor named Sternberg, it doesn't mean that they were an astronomer who lived on the hill, right? It means that they thought that name sounded beautiful or some official thought that name sounded beautiful. Okay, how about this one? Eisenfeld is coming in. That's correct, and it means iron field, which again, doesn't really make sense, so it was kind of hard to find a picture. And finally, this one. Birnbaum. Correct, so that means pear tree. And there you go, you guys did a great job on this matching game. So I'm gonna take a minute and play a song. Oh, let's see if I can get this online. There we go. Now you can't see that. Okay. Um, give me a minute. I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to try playing it from my computer. Give me a second here. Okay, well, it looks like the video became unavailable, but let me try one more time. No. Okay, well, this was a song that you would have loved. It was about people who have the name Berg. <laughs> and uh, I will try to make that available to you later. And, okay. So to summarize what we've talked about so far, Jewish names are similar to local non-Jewish names, but they also have some distinctive features. And although Jews around the world have diverse histories of naming, they share some traits and they even share some names. They might be pronounced a bit differently, but they have some common names. So now we move on to name changing. In many places, including Russia, the UK, Hungary, and Israel, Jews changed their names, especially their family names. And they did this for different reasons in different places. In Russia, some of the name changes had to do with avoiding conscription. And often this would happen when a Jewish boy was coming of age and there was a concern that he would be conscripted because he was the oldest, uh, he was the second oldest child boy in the family and so he would be adopted by another family and would actually take on that family's name and so that's one way that jews changed their names in the uk and hungary it had to do with integrating into the society and in hungary the magyarization process in israel it had to do with the same thing integrating into the society but in this case a jewish society so people would change their names from their um, Muslim, uh, or sorry, their Arabic sounding name or their Persian sounding name or their um, Ashkenazi sounding name and take on a Hebrew sounding name. And that actually happened in my family. My name Benor is actually my grandfather and grandmother's invention. Their original name was Bloom, an ornamental name meaning flower, and they changed it to Benor in 1948. 
So, um, but I want to talk about name changes that happened in America. And I'm going to do this by starting with celebrities. So here are some celebrities who changed their names. Just take a minute and look at that. There will be a quiz, but not on these particular names. So I will now show you some names and you tell me which celebrities these are. I'm gonna give you their original names. Isser Danilovich, you can write it in the chat. Josh, are there any answers coming in there? One minute I had to, Kirk Douglas. That is correct, Kirk Douglas. Judy Tuim. There seems to be some 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 uh, people looking online now for the answer. Let's see. <laughs> Judy Garland, people ask. No, it's actually Judy Holiday. Okay, how about this, Bernie Schwartz? Bernie Schwartz is. Uh... We got a bunch of Tony Curtises. Yes, that's right. Bell Silverman. We have one in for Beverly Sills. That is correct. Alan Stewart Konigsberg. And we got some unanimity on Woody Allen and I have to make a plug because he is my he is my wife's godfather's cousin. Your wife's, wow. Okay, you have a connection. In Brazil, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jacob Cohen. Ooh, that could be anybody. Let's see. Yes, that could be anybody. Kobe Bryant. <laughs> <laughs> no. Rodney Dangerfield. Yes, that's good. Now, uh, why did they change their names? Because they couldn't get no respect. OK, that was my Rodney Dangerfield impression. Um, but actually, why did they change their names? There's a whole book on this by Kirsten from English. It's called A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, Jewish Name Changing in America. And I highly recommend it if you're interested in this topic. But before I get into the book, I actually have a poll for you. And this poll is about Ellis Island name changing. And so I would like you to answer this not in the chat, but I'm gonna send out a poll and here you go. The question is, do you have as part of your family lore an Ellis Island name change story? The options are yes, no, but my family did enter through the US through Ellis Island and no, and my family didn't enter the US through Ellis Island. And the answers are coming in. I'll give you another few seconds. Okay, so most of you have voted and I will end it now. Okay, well, it looks like it's pretty evenly split here. 27% yes, uh, or sorry, 35%, 27 of you do have as your family lore, as part of your family lore, an Ellis Island name change story. I wish I had time for you all to tell us these stories. Um, some of you, do and some of you don't, but what's interesting is that many of you actually do. And, oh, sorry, I didn't share the results. There you go. Here are the results. So the, now I have to stop sharing the results so you can see my screen again. So this is actually a very common story in American Jewish communities. Many families do have this story. I have a story in my family. It didn't involve our family name, but our first names. My grandfather named Henry Schultz had a father named Sam Schultz, and he had four brothers named Sam Schultz. And so the family story goes that they were all in line at Ellis Island, and Zalman gets to the front of the line and says, I'm Zalman. And they, the, the clerk says, okay, you'll be Sam. And then Shimon gets to the front, and he says, the clerk says, okay, you'll be Sam. And then Schmulbear gets to the front, okay, you'll be Sam. And Schlema gets to the right. So that's actually not how it happened. That's how I, I learned it as a child, and I think that's how my grandparents learned it as well. But 
what what we know is that <clears throat> that there actually isn't historical evidence that names were changed at Ellis Island. Now, often when I say this in my talks, people get very upset because this is such a central part of their family lore. And I understand that because it's part of mine as well. But the, the reality is that the clerks at Ellis Island were actually required to match the names of the documents on the documents to the names on the ship manifests that came in. And so it is very unlikely that this happened. It may have happened in select cases uh, because uh, some people uh, you know, insist that they have family evidence that this did happen at Ellis Island. So maybe it did happen in some cases, but for the most part, it happened later. The name changes happened later. And here's how from English explains this. Well, in general, the name changes that happened, and she focused on New York, had to do with anti-Semitism. They were, uh, they, when people changed their names, that enabled them to move up in society. It enabled them to determine when they were going to identify as Jewish because they were having trouble getting jobs when their names were very identifiably Jewish. And a common myth was that name changers left the Jewish community. They weren't interested in their Jewish identity, but that is not actually true. We have many examples of people who became synagogue and federation presidents and leaders in the Jewish community and other areas who had changed their names. Part of the anti-Semitism was that many hotels wouldn't allow Jewish guests and the AAA even published lists of restricted and unrestricted hotels like the Green Book in, that was made famous recently by a movie. Uh, there were similar lists uh, for, for um, Jew, hotels that Jews would be able to stay in. And you can see here a discriminatory form from, um, ad, for admissions into universities that asks about nationality and religion and birthplace, name of paternal and maternal grandfather and their birthplaces. And this shows that even if you changed your name, you, if you were going to be honest about these other things, they were looking to see your ancestral background. But names did play a huge role in the discrimination in professional schools. And it started to change in the 1960s. The quotas and other discriminatory admissions practices stopped at most schools and hotels improved. And you start to see a major drop in the percentage of name change petitions that were for ethnic reasons. So you can see here the, the, the largest percentage was in the 40s and 50s. And after that, it started to go down. In the 70s and 80s, there were fewer name changes in general. There was less anti-Semitism. Most Jews at that point were financially secure. And they had an increasing pride in their Jewishness, influenced by the civil rights movement, the celebration of ethnic authenticity, and also the increasing distance from immigration. If they were the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of people who had immigrated to this country, then they might be less likely to be ashamed of their ancestries. So in this period, the 70s and 80s, we start to see an increase in distinctive Jewish first names, which I'll be talking about next week. And some Jews actually reclaimed their ancestral family names. So you get people like Irving Wallace and his son, David Wallachinsky, because David reclaimed that family name that had been changed or Melanie K. slash Kantrowitz, who took on the Kantrowitz as another part of her name to reclaim her family heritage. And today, many contemporary Jewish celebrities keep their names. So you get singer Adam Levine, actor Sasha Baron Cohen, and actor Rachel Weisz. So in conclusion, many American Jews do not have identifiably Jewish surnames because of intermarriage and because of name changing. But surnames remain an important aspect of how Jews identify in America, how they identify each other as Jewish or not, as you saw in that clip at the beginning, and how non-Jews identify Americans as Jews. 
And we see that American Jews are, the names that American Jews have are quite diverse based on where they're from around the world, but the majority of American Jews have Ashkenazi names because the majority of American Jews are from Eastern and Central Europe. And if we look at Jewish names around the world, we see a unity and a diversity in the names that, that different communities have. We also see that Jews have come up with creative ways to maintain their distinctiveness and to integrate into local society through their names and their name changing. And we are talking about this through the lens of names, also known as onomastic, that onomastics is the study of names, but we could do a similar analysis through language, through music, through food and other cultural domains where we could look at the unity and diversity of Jewish cultural practices, how Jews around the world have some similarities in their language and their music and their food, et cetera, but they also have influences from the local society and also distinctive features based on where they're living. The end. Now I'm looking forward to your questions and comments and I know there already are a lot of them. And uh, so please, Josh, with ask a bunch of, uh, of interesting questions. Thank you, Sarah, for this fascinating look into uh, Jewish onomastics and by virtue of that, our story, the story of all of us uh, participating one way or the other. Um, I'd like to start off with a question that came uh, outside of the realm of the New World and transatlantic uh, immigration and ask about Zionist name changing in Palestine and Israel. Yeah, so I mentioned that a bit, uh, that that was quite common uh, and even required for some government officials to have a Hebrew name. Um, and this was part of the negation of the diaspora, the idea that they were creating an Israeli society that would be Hebraic in nature and would uh, avoid the stigma of the diaspora countries in which people lived. You're muted again. Uh, thank you. Um, we have a question. Um, you spoke just now about how it was sometimes required uh, in general or in Europe back in the old uh, country. Is there a category of names that were uh, enforced or coerced rather than merely preferable? Well, it was required that each family take on a hereditary name in various places at various times. So in that sense, it's coerced. Um, now the question of who chose the names is different in different places. And we don't actually know for sure in most places who chose the name, if it was a if it was the Jew himself and it was generally the man or if it was the clerk who was assigning the name. Um, but whether, whether certain names were coerced or not, it seems that in rare cases, it must have been when there were derogatory names, but the fact that those were so rare suggests that that wasn't the normal situation. Speaking of derogatory names, um, one person asks about the possibility of Goldwasser, uh, golden water, uh, being an insult, uh, and if this was a possibility churlish clerks or some other source that was hostile. Uh, it's it's possible, but it's more likely that this was just one of those names that was ornamental, that sounded beautiful. Gold Vasser, it sounds beautiful. Um, A-U-H-2-O, -A 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 right? Golden, yeah, you're raising the, uh, the value of the water. Um, <laughs> we spoke about the, some of the reasons or some of the dynamics that happened onomastically at Ellis Island. And one person asks specifically, not about the clerk at Ellis Island actively changing the name, but rather the clerk at Ellis Island being a cause for the change in the spelling of the name, maybe from Cyrillic alphabet to Latin alphabet. And they give an example of the name Sirotti, S-I-R-O-T-Y, for example, and it's a variant, S-E-R-O-T-A. So it's 
it's more likely that that change happened in Germany when people were leaving from ports in Germany. So they may have lived in a Slavic speaking country in, a, a, in Russia where they wrote in Cyrillic letters, but they likely would have embarked from a port in Germany or elsewhere where they had the ship manifest written in Latin letters. Um, and also uh, originally when Jews were given their names, they were often given them by German speaking officials, like in the Austro-Hungarian em empire, for example. And when that happened, it was a, uh, when that happened, um, it, they would have been um, written in Germanic style. So that the, the um, Owitz, for example, would have been written ITZ instead of I, C or um, or other other spellings, and so that's an explanation for why so many American Jewish names are spelled in with Germanic uh, influences. Now that's not the case for Russians who came to America in the 80s and 90s. They tend to have more phonetic sounding names, so like Steingart instead of Steingart, right? Or they need to be. Um, or they would be names like um, Weinstock, written V-A-Y-N-S-H-T-O-K instead of W-E-I-N-S, yeah. A couple of uh, people picked up on your closing comments about the creative ways that today, contemporarily, uh, contem are, are changing names or engaging with the whole idea of, of naming. And they're curious about some examples that you've heard. Sure. Well, some of the create creativity has to do with how people changed their names. So sometimes people changed their names based on sound. So Rosenberg might become another name starting with R and Cohen might become Cowan, right? Um, but sometimes it was based on meaning. And so they would take on a name that has the same meaning, right? And that happened in Israel as well, where you have um, Green becoming Ben Gurion, and you also have um, Bloom becoming Ben Or, but you also have, um, let's say, uh, Licht becoming something with Or, right? Then the light. And so they would take on names that have that were similar semantically rather than phonologically. Um, but today you also have creativity in people choosing new family names. If they, the two people get married, sometimes they'll take, one will take on the other's name. Um, usually the woman takes on the man's name, but um, some families like mine, the man takes on the woman's name. Um, and then sometimes they'll hyphenate their names, but sometimes they'll come up with a completely new name. And I have permission to share uh, my colleague Sivan Zakai's story um, that her her family name um, was Kroll Zeldin and her husband's name um, started with, uh, I think, an I or a Y. And so they came up with th those three letters, Z-K-I or Zayin Kaf Yud. And so that became their family name, Zakai. And so um, there are a lot of creative ways that people are doing this, uh, combining elements of the two names. And sometimes they, they'll still sound Jewish. Sometimes they'll be Hebrew, um, like Zakai. Um, and sometimes they'll just be um, interesting, interesting sounds that don't have any particular Jewish resonance. I got a personal question uh, for me. What kind of name is Holo? That's my last name. I'm going to defer on that answer questions. And if there's time at the end, I'll be happy to tell my story. In the meanwhile, okay. however, I want to ask you about, um, uh, someone asked about Jews in Persia changing their last name to an Armenian one. I'm not sure if that's what happened or if the IAN ending appears Armenian. Yeah, I think the IAN ending just is, is similar in, in Iranian and, and Armenian cultures. Uh, someone asked about the uh, very common suffix SKI slash SKY. Yeah, so it means son of in Polish. And in fact, in Poland today, women will be ska and men will be ski. But in the time when, when Jews received their family names, the entire family was uh, given the name ending in ski. So it just means, it means son of. We have some questions uh, about, the, about people's own uh, family names. 
one of them having to do with the relationship between Russian uh, and I guess other languages, including Hebrew, and the the g, the ch, and the h, or the r, yeah. these sounds as they're reflected in names. And did they mention their specific name that they wanted to ask about? Yeah, the the um, it uh, we have the name Hurwitz or Gerwitz or Horwitz. Right. Yeah, so Gerwitz is a good example of the H sound not existing in Russian and being replaced by the G sound. And it's interesting, you would think that it might be replaced with the H sound, which does exist in Russian, but it tended to be replaced with a G sound. Another example of that is Helfand or Gelfand, which means elephant and was an ornamental name or perhaps a house sign name. Um, I don't think it means that, I mean, I'm pretty sure it doesn't mean that that family was a circus master or traded in elephants or anything like that. but. Um, the uh, the name Helfand and Gelfand both mean elephant. We have a question about uh, hyphenated and married names, a little bit like the story of our colleague Zakai, but I wonder also in the past, um, our attendee asks about, like in Spanish non-Jewish culture where uh, the mother's name is transmitted to the child as well, uh, do we, or or the, the joint last name, of the wife in marriage. Is there any kind of um, agglutinative uh, Jewish thing whereby we have more than one name that grows on? Yes, certainly that's the case with Jews in Latin American countries today and with a lot of Jews in America today, that a lot of Jews in America today are doing the hyphenation thing. And, um, and that's just another example of how Jews integrate into the local society and take on practices of the local society while still maintaining their distinctiveness. So you do get hyphenated names in Latin America and the US, but they tend to be hy hyphenated Jewish sounding last names. One question about one of the uh, Sephardic uh, common names that you started off with, Hakam or Hakam, H-A-K-A-M. Um, and because of that spelling, our uh, participant asks uh, if you can tell the geographical or occupational, well, the occupation, yes, but the geographical origin of a particular name, given that it's spelled H-A-K-A-M. Um, I personally can't, but there probably are scholars that can, but the problem is it may have changed in the spelling over the years. So if the name is spelled, um, you know, H-A-K-A-M or H-A-H-A-M or H-A-K-H-A-M, or it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it came from a certain place. It could have just been the spelling could have just been changed at some point. Um, I have a question about the possibility of a given name jumping categories. So uh, the example was uh, a name starts out as Kahan, which would be Cohen, but then becomes Klein, which is, I guess, a descriptor or a, an, a, a descriptive name. So um, are there other cases where the uh, last name changes the actual category? Oh yeah, absolutely. If somebody changes their name, they might take on a name from a different category. And sometimes people would change their name to another Jewish sounding name. They're not changing it so they sound less Jewish, but they're ch changing it because it's hard to pronounce or, or perhaps they don't want to be identified with a particular family member. There, there are many reasons that people change their names and, and that can certainly happen that it would change categories like that. One um, has to do with the possible historical order or um, the, the, if there's an earlier cause in history that might promote Jews adopting a certain name as opposed to perhaps later causes in the development of a family or the political situation in which they live. Specifically, the question is, did the European last name tradition start first and foremost with professional descriptive names um, and then go into these other categories? Or is there in fact no rhyme or reason as to you know, which category you might've started off with? Yeah, great question. So initially when people didn't have hereditary family names, they, they needed a way to distinguish all the people named Moisha in the community, right? And so they did this through various descriptors. It could be through um, a characteristic. So they could say Moisha Klein, meaning Moisha, the small one or Moisha Schneider, Moisha the tailor, right? And so the names that people eventually took on as their hereditary family names 
were often based on the names that they had been using as their non-hereditary family names originally. A another example could be a place that they're from. If their family was, um, if their name was Deutsch and they lived in Poland, that mean meant that their family had come from Germany, right? And so <clears throat> when, when people took on these names, um, sometimes it was based on that. Um, but the names, when the names were assigned, there isn't evidence that a particular type of name happened first. Um, in fact, there is evidence that all of the name types happened in, 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 in any given place, but some name types were more prevalent in others. So in Galicia, for example, the ornamental names were quite common. And in part, parts of Lithuania, Hebrew names happened to be more common names like Malamed and Kohen. Um, and so, and um, matronymic names were common in some places, but not others. So, um, so the types of names were different in different places, but it wasn't the case that, that a certain name type started first and then others followed, except for the case of the ornamental names, which didn't start until 1787. I have two questions about non-Jews. One is, in general, did other ethnic groups change their names at the same rate as Jews? And follow up to that from a different questioner is, do we know of non-Jews who consciously chose Jewish names? Yeah, well, let me answer the second one first. Whoopi Goldberg is a great example of a non-Jew who took on a Jewish name because um, she felt that it would be beneficial for her in, in the entertainment industry. Uh, and I'm sure there are other examples of that. And then the, what was the other part? Sorry. Do, do other ethnicities oh, change right. their name at the same rate? Uh, no, not at the same rate. And it's interesting. In, um, there are certainly cases in from Aglish's book. She, she talks a bit about other groups changing names, but it was much less common. And um, in the, the mass wave of immigration of Jews was from the 1880s to the 1920s. Around that time, there were also other groups that were coming, Italians, Irish. They didn't tend to change their names at the same, at, at rates that were as high as Jews. But um, now you might be wondering about all the groups that came. So what about the many immigrants that came after 1967 when immigration restrictions were eased? And the answer is they didn't tend to change their family names, um, partly because at that point in history, it wasn't as, there wasn't as much of a stigma around being part of a, an identifiable ethnic group, but also because they were racialized, because they would be identifiable by their appearance, right? As being from Asia or Latin America or Africa. And, and so changing their name wouldn't help them with the discrimination that they would, that they would experience. Um, and at that point in the late 60s and, and early 70s, um, there was, we were at a stage in American history when, when it was actually cool to have a distinctive name. And, and so they would be less likely to change it. Now there are still name change petitions today, but they tend to be for administrative reasons, like something didn't match on their social security card and their passport, and so they couldn't get some service. And so that's the kind of thing that people tend to change. And of course, when people get married, they, they, they often change their name. Um, and people have other personal reasons for changing their names as well. Um, I have a question about um, double first names or first middle names like Sarah Ruch, Shana Liba, uh, yeah, Bear. let's let's save that one for next time because the next lecture is going to be about personal names. Ah, okay. And it looks like we only have time for one more question. And let's make that your question, Josh Holo. Uh, what is he, where is your last name from? My last name is, it was asked by a person who may be a fellow Sephardi. My family is from Turkey and um, it's an Turkey? Americanization of Halio, H-A-L-I-Y-O or H-A-L-I-O. And it was changed after Ellis Island in the city of Cincinnati in the shadow of the Hebrew Union College. And uh, my family's headstones are still there. And we can see the generation that shifted from Halio to Holo, currently in the family lore, simply for simplification. And it comes from the Arabic halwa, meaning sweet. And is that related to the word halva? Halva? Related to the word halva, the sweet uh, sesame um, 
thing, although we have no way of knowing if there's any connection. It is so a is member that... family group of names that is spelled Halegwa in Greek, and in North Africa, it still is Halwa. Oh, great. Now, I'm sure that there are other questions about your own personal names, and I'll be happy to answer those by email if you send them to me. And I'll just end by saying, I would love to see an online database of names. There is a website uh, from the Diaspora Museum, Beit HaTfutsot, the Museum of the Jewish People, that has a lot of good information about names, but it also has a lot of mistakes and doesn't, and, and has a lot of names missing. The resources that we have that have the best and the most information are the books by Alexander Bider, and I am working with him to create an online database. I've applied for a grant, and if I get that, then hopefully in the next year or so, we'll be able to uh, create such a database where you can look up your name and find out the detailed history of it. And you can also compare names and you'll be able to say um, which culture, which Jewish communities had the most matronymic names or the most profession names. And so a lot of the questions that you were asking, the quantitative ones, I think could be answered by such a database. And so let's hope that that, that, that will happen in the uh, near future. Thank you so much for uh, to Josh Holo for for moderating and thank you all for coming. And here is to next week when we're going to hear from you again on Jewish individual names, right? Yeah. So we look forward to that and thank you for an amazing lecture. I'm filled with comments of uh, appreciation. Thank you very much. And here's to next week. Bye. Great. Thank you.